Well, Halito, Chinchukma. Uh, my name is Kelby Kennedy, and I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I'm a policy counsel for the National Congress of American Indians, and I want to welcome you here today to NCAI's third webinar in our three-part webinar series on tribal uh, disaster preparedness. Thank you so much for spending either your afternoon with us if you're here on the East Coast or your morning with us if you're out in Alaska. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to hand the floor over to two of my colleagues, uh, Naomi and Amy, who will be helping us with tech during the event uh, to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we start. Naomi and Amy. Hi, thank you, Kelby. I'm Naomi Rama. I'm the event producer at NCAI, and today I'll be helping as Kelby mentioned with the tech support. Um, thank you everyone for joining the third webinar for NCAI Disaster Preparedness um, titled Exploring the Tribal Disaster Declaration Process, How to Access Emergency Resources When Your Tribal Nation Needs Them Most. Before we get started, let's go over basic housekeeping items and expectations for today's webinar meeting. The first item we'll cover is Q&A. During the webinar today, there will be a various stopping points where Q&A will occur. However, until we reach these points in our agenda, all microphones will remain muted except for the panelists. Please also make sure your cameras are turned off during today's presentation to allow only speaking panelists to be on camera. You may turn your camera, uh, you may turn your camera on when you are speaking during a Q&A portion of our agenda. There are two ways to share input during open discussion. One, enter your question in the chat box and team member will share your question with the speaker during the Q&A side. Or you can raise your hand by tapping the hand button at the bottom of your participation panel. We will call on you and send you a digital request to unmute your line. You can mute and unmute your microphone by dialing star six if connected by phone or using the mobile phone's mute button if connected by your mobile device. Or you may also click the microphone icon on the Zoom meeting room at the bottom left corner of your screen. Don't worry, we'll post this information in the chat box for your reference. Next, if you're experiencing technical, issue, te technical issues at any time during the presentation, please reach out to us in the chat box. We'll respond through private message and get your issue resolved. Any additional comments during the presentation should be submitted through the chat box. Lastly, we have a quick reminder. The webinar will be recorded and will be posted at NCAI's YouTube page. If you do not want to be recorded, please disconnect from the webinar at this time. Thank you for your patience in listening to these instructions. I believe we can go ahead and get started. I will now turn the floor over to our webinar moderator, Mr. Robert Holden. Robert Holden is a tribal program administrator for Louisiana State University National Center of Biomedical Research and Training, Academy of Counter-Terrorist Education. Mr. Holden is also a former deputy director of NCAI. Mr. Holden, the floor is yours. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's our greetings to you. Hope everyone is well this day um, in these uh, vexing times of COVID-19. And um, bid everyone uh, welcome. And uh, as we said, I am Robert Holden, Choctaw Chickasaw, uh, tribal liaison at NCD uh, PRT, uh, Academy of Counterterrorist Education. I want to thank the National Congress of American Indians for sponsoring this production. Uh, and, NCI is pleased to offer this third and final webinar for tribal officials and presented by tribal and federal officials who have spent their careers working with Indian country. Uh, NCI working with tribal leaders was successful in 2013 amending the Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act that authorized tribal governments the option to directly request a presidential emergency or major disaster declaration. FEMA published the De Tribal Declaration's pilot guidance in January 2017 as a resource to tribes seeking to exercise tribal sovereignty throughout the declaration decision-making process. Now, if you're not familiar with a guidance document, according to the General Accounting, Government Accounting Office, the GAO, which is the lead watchdog for the federal government, the purchase purpose of an agency to issue a guidance document is to explain new regulations, respond to stakeholder questions, and clarify existing policies and procedures. A guidance document may explain how regulations are interpreted by the agency and until finalized, it's not a legally binding document. 
this administrative guidance comes under the category of advice and recommendations. Uh, the, the dialogue today will cover the presenters' experiences regarding requirements, as well as the considerations, including cost effectiveness in managing a travel direct disaster declaration. Uh, we will cover various sections of the travel declarations pilot guidance, as well as hear from Alaska Native subject matter experts regarding their experiences, concerns, and recommendations on disaster management, including uh, what I just mentioned, uh, consider other consideration. We'll also fo focus on disaster management involving Alaska Native communities and villages. Um, as Kelby said, there'll be a short Q&A round after each section. And at the end of the session, we'll have a last round of Q&A. Uh, without further delay, I want to introduce this uh, stellar lineup of speakers with us today, uh, starting back again with Kelby Kennedy. Perfect. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, really appreciate your hard work on this webinar series and, and really appreciate our speakers being able to come and really appreciate all of our attendees uh, spending a couple of hours with us today. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Kelby Kennedy. I am a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I am a policy counsel that works for the National Congress of American Indians. And a large portion of my portfolio actually focuses on tribal emergency management as well as tribal homeland security issues. Um, I was born and raised on my reservation in southeastern Oklahoma and can tell you from firsthand experience how important my nation's emergency management program has been to me and my family personally. It has saved countless lives um, across our nation and in southeastern Oklahoma. And I know that you know it, it is such a, an important resource for many tribal citizens. And the best way to start preparing for a disaster is getting some basic information, getting some important information. And I believe you're going to be able to find that through not just today, but the first two webinar series as well. So Yakuke, thank you for being here with us. And with that being said, I'm going to hand the floor off uh, to a fellow Choctaw, uh, Jeff Hansen. Jeff? Hello. Um, my name is Jeff Hansen, and I am the uh, Director of uh, Community Protection for the Choctaw Nation. Um, within that role, I serve as uh, the head of the emergency management department, um, the office of the fire marshal and uh, the probation department within public safety. Um, been in this role for eight years um, and um, have done everything I can to, to really just push the bar forward when it comes to emergency management in Indian country. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to uh, also serve as the vice chair of the FEMA National Advisory Council and, and continue to try to uh, push the issues uh, forward so that we, our voices in Indian country are heard and that uh, FEMA policy and, and uh, uh, implementation uh, is uh, beneficial to, to the tribes and uh, how we move forward. Uh, one of my major goals is always is, you know, helping other tribes uh, get, get programs up and running if they don't have them or, or just uh, working with them uh, to expand capability. So looking forward to today and thank you for being on the webinar. And with that, I believe I'm turning it over to Nelson. All right, Wanikisuk and Gutapatush for your time. Natasawish Nelson Andrews Jr. Uh, good day and thank you for everyone's attendance during this webinar and uh, a big thank you to NCAI for hosting these series of webinars. Um, my name is Nelson Andrews Jr. and I am the Emergency Management Director for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Nation. We're located uh, on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, I've been serving in this capacity now for the past six years. Um, and we've basically been able to establish a very robust emergency management department uh, with all the efficient plans needed and uh, resources needed to uh, serve our tribal community. One of uh, my biggest goals this whole, whole time of uh, building this emergency management department for our tribe is to have uh, equal capacity to our state partners um, in the same and provide the same amount of resources that our, our state counterparts and county counterparts provide uh, to their um, jurisdictions um, that we can provide as well to ours. Um, I also serve as the co-chairman for the United South and Eastern Tribes Homeland Security Emergency Services Committee. Uh, and with that, um, such as, uh, as Jeff's ambitions, we um, were able to provide assistance to other tribes as well. Um, that's you know, been a big goal of mine as well to, 
to support all tribes um, as needed to build their capacity uh, in the, the realm of emergency management. Um, I've worked for FEMA prior for uh, 12 years. So um, I took all that experience back to our tribal nation and uh, we're looking forward to sharing our experiences with you all. And again, Kutapatish for, for your time and for attending. Thank you. Kelby, if you want to turn it over to Brian, thank you. I'm Brian Ridley. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Canada Chiefs Conference in Interior, Alaska. Uh, we've got 37 federally recognized tribes in our region, um, and I'm a tribal member of the native village of Eagle. I'll hand it over to Ramona. Good morning from Alaska, everyone. My name is Ramona Van Cleve, and I am a tribal liaison for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I am a lifelong Alaskan. I was fortunate enough to help with the Eagle Rebuild that Brian will discuss. And my background is pretty extensive with emergency management and with tribes. But I really think that working as a donations coordinator for the World Trade Center bombing, I was the lead coordinator for that. What I found is that tribes help tribes and people help people more so than what government does. And I really hope we can focus on some of that and still access all the great government programs that are available. So I'll be talking about that later and thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Monroe from the Department of Homeland Security where I am the Director of Tribal Affairs. The first thing I want to do is recognize the Anacostan people and the lands that the department's headquarters is on just across the river from here and the Piscataway tribe uh, in Maryland and the lands that I'm in uh, at our home. Um, my primary role here is to listen uh, and, and to gather information uh, that's important to tribes and Alaska Native uh, villages, your, uh, your cities and your, your tribal uh, uh, associations or village corporations. Um, most importantly, what I want to do is make sure that you have my contact information. So I always like to share my uh, cell phone number, 202-360-8992. Uh, and I'll post that in the notes in a second. But again, 202-360-8998. So the Department of Homeland Security is the third largest federal executive. And one of its components that you're discussing primarily today is uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, but as a single point of contact to get you in contact with the right folks, uh, feel free to bug me at any time. Um, Ramona is uh, obviously uh, being the tribal liaison from FEMA. You know, she's the subject matter expert that I'm always going to try and point you to uh, to get the right resources up there in the um, Alaska region of, of FEMA's, uh, FEMA's region up there or the Alaska area of FEMA region up there. So I just want to make sure that you, you know who I am, uh, that I'm on here. I'm supportive. Um, and I'll share a couple other remarks um, related to some of the activities of the administration uh, in a little while. So, uh, Robert. I'd like to turn it back over to you so you can introduce um, Leo Barrett. Uh, Barrett Ristroff uh, with the Ristroff Law Planning and Research is unable to join us today. She's on travel, but nevertheless, uh, we do have a video courtesy of Barrett and uh, we'll be showing that in a bit. Uh, but she's spent her life working with tribal communities um, Nonprofits on climate change dash adapt, adaptation, hard for me to say, natural hazard mitigation, natural resources, native law, planning, research, and facilitating dialogues. So she'll be joining us uh, via video in a bit. Um, so with that, uh, I think we will turn it over and begin our presentations. Well, I think I'm going to be kicking this off with uh, what exactly is the Stafford Act and presidential declarations. Um, so the Stafford Act is the authorizing language um, that uh, created uh, federal assistance, so to speak, for um, uh, when this was written, states and local jurisdictions. Um, it uh, spells out two, um, basically two 
major categories that you can get a declaration for. Uh, the first is an emergency declaration, and, and uh, Nelson is going to uh, speak about that here shortly. But uh, the other is the, the major, de de uh, major disaster declaration. Within the major disaster declaration, there are several levels of assistance that is available. Um, and uh, there are uh, several categories where that, that, that assistance can come in. So there are, there are two categories that fall under what they call uh, emergency protective uh, measures. So things like debris management um, and uh, emergency procedures like um, sheltering and, and um, feeding and, and those kind of things that, that are immediate, um, immediate actions that you can do to uh, protect life. Um, those items would fall into to categories A and B. Um, the category C through, through G um, are the, the more permanent work. And so this is where emergency declarations and major declarations really kind of uh, vary. Um, within a major declaration, you have opportunity to get uh, assistance with what they call um, uh, long-term projects or, or permanent, permanent work. Uh, such as fixing roads or bridges that have been damaged from uh, some type of a disaster, whether that is a, an ice flow that's taken out a bridge or, um, you know, flooding that has impacted a, a tribal facility. Um, there are, uh, you have roads and, roads and bridges, you have uh, water control facilities, um, you have public buildings, contents, public utilities, and then parks and recreation. So those are the additional categories that kind of come along with a major declaration. Um, the other thing that you can get uh, through a major declaration is, is individual assistance uh, for your citizens. Um, that is a, an opportunity that opens up some uh, very specific efforts uh, to provide assistance to individuals. Um, that can be uh, through pro uh, programs like the Individuals and Households Program uh, that can provide housing assistance, financial assistance, and then there's other needs assistance um, that uh, can help with different uh, items like uh, funeral expenses, um, uh, personal property that might not have been insured. Uh, you have disaster unemployment assistance. There's, there's a lot of these programs out there, and I would, I would highly encourage you to really kind of dive into the um, uh, tribal pilot guidance. It spells it out a little more, and, and I know we covered this um, in the other webinar, so feel, please feel free to go review that. But I think that the biggest thing that I want to talk about when it comes to major major disaster declarations is um, a lot of the things that you can do on the front end before a disaster happens. Um, there are certain plans that are required, like the, like the hazard mitigation plan, um, the emergency operations plan. These are all things that you can do on uh, before the disaster happens, and it'll actually help to make the process much smoother uh, if something were to occur that, that you needed to, to uh, request federal assistance. Um, these are big plans, um, and uh, there, there are opportunities that if you um, don't have them in place, um, that you know, there, there's a time frame after a disaster that you can, you can work to, to get one adopted and in place, um, but it, it's, it's a, lot, a lot better for your, 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 your tribe and, and uh, uh, your community to, to go ahead and start working on those plans and, and making sure that um, they are finished, approved, adopted by, by the, your council, uh, your leadership, and, uh, and FEMA has, has accepted those documents. There's some other plans that kind of come along with a declaration, and I know Nelson's going to touch on this, but um, the, the public administration plan, um, that also is a document that you can kind of build out a template before the event and then make the changes that are needed that are specific to the disaster. Um, so there's just a lot of things that you can do on the front end that will, will ultimately make you more successful. Um, but we, you know, tribes have been working toward this and, and there are a lot of uh, technical assistance items out there that can help get, get you to the finish line, so to speak. Um, and, and get these things in order. Um, the, the other thing that I think with major declarations um, is the financial side uh, that, uh, you know, keeping track of all of your expenses and, and making sure that you are uh, working with FEMA uh, to get the project worksheets done. 
but on all of these things, you can request technical assistance from FEMA to, to get assistance with that. Um, so in the end, uh, major declarations, you know, multiple tribes have, have uh, requested these and, and received them. Um, and I know that, that you all on, on the line, um, if you have no experience with it, it's just a matter of uh, um, working with your with other tribes, working with FEMA and and uh, uh, making sure that you've, you you um, kind of get that legwork done on the front end and, and you all will be successful with it as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Nelson to to speak about the emergency side, uh, the emergency declarations. Um, and uh, you can kind of see where they're a little bit different. Um, so, Nelson. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, appreciate uh, the, all that information that you shared and for um, the introduction into this next segment. So I'm going to cover um, a little bit on the uh, the request for for emergency declarations. And uh, Mr. Holden, he gave a, a good background already on uh, the Sandy Recovery Improvement Act. Um, it was amended uh, of the Stafford Act to allow tribal governments um, the choice to either request uh, an emergency or major disaster de disaster declaration, independently of a stake or a state or or seek disaster assistance um, through a state declaration. Um, quick example of uh, our tribe now we're under an emergency declaration and we have been for the past uh, 369 days now um, of our emergency operations center being activated, um, and this is for the co national COVID-19 emergency. Um, some tribes you may have heard um, recently went under um, major disaster declaration as well uh, during this time. Um, so one of the differences of the, uh, the emergency uh, disaster uh, declaration is, um, first I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what it is. Um, so your, your chief, right, or your, um, your chairman or the, the executive of your tribal government, um, they may submit a request for a declaration um, by any president that, uh, that an emergency exists or an emergency could occur. Um, according to FEMA, uh, an emergency is an occasion or instance uh, for which in the, the determination of the pres uh, president, federal assistance is needed to supplement tribal, state, and local efforts and capabilities to save lives and to protect uh, property and public health and safety uh, or to lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe uh, in any part of the United States. And that includes uh, tribal nations, um, corporations um, in Alaska villages as well. Um, an emergency declaration is intended to provide immediate uh, short-term assistance uh, to, essential to save lives, protect public health, uh, safety, and property, or to lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe. Therefore, emergency declarations uh, do not authorize long-term mitigation assistance. Um, so some of the stuff that um, that that Jeff was mentioning um, under the major disaster declaration uh, where, you know, would tie into the, the long-term assistance. Um, so uh, one of the types of assistance that, that is available to the emergency de declaration, which we're under now is called uh, public assistance disaster declaration. And I'll get into that um, in a little bit. Um, so additional requirements um, are uh, a description that the, the tribal government um, has utilized all its resources um, to alleviate the emergency. Um, and also, um, you must provide a description of, and type of uh, the extent of um, additional federal assistance required. One of the things that we had to uh, do here when we went ahead and, and declared our, our state of emergency um, was I had to go before our tribal council and, um, and request that, you know, the permission to go to the federal government. Um, so basically, we have to write a letter to our regional administrator in FEMA. Um, you know, declaring a state of emergency and um, and explaining that we had uh, utilized all of our resources and that we needed um, direct federal assistance. And that's the start of the process. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Kilby. So that, that process um, for us and for um, any other tribe that's, you know, that's gonna take this avenue, it requires um, getting some of your administrative items in place. Um, so, I mean, a lot of tribes and um, corporations already have, you know, your, your basics, right? Um, but some don't. Um, one of the main things that you'll need is uh, to get your DUNS and your finance um, administrative uh, requirements in place. Um, 
and you'll need to set that up so you can receive the funds once you start submitting um, uh, projects for reimbursement, right? Um, one of the plans that Jeff had, Jeff had mentioned was it's called the PA Public Assistance Administrative Plan. Uh, for us, we didn't have that plan in place um, and neither did any of the other tribes within our region. So we had to go ahead and, uh, and start from scratch. Um, we had to go ahead and, and basically write this PA admin plan and submit it to FEMA headquarters. Um, the next step was, it's called a FEMA tribe agreement. Um, this has to be basically established through your, your, your attorneys and the legal framework uh, within your tribal government. Um, so the difference between tribes and states is states normally have uh, the, the time and opportunity to have, have these plans already ready to go. Um, not the, the large majority of tribes don't have this as an option. Um, states, they practice this throughout the year. And that's the difference between, the, you know, between us, between our, our tribal governments and uh, between states. So we're hoping to you know, be able to share a little bit of insight into the, uh, the approaches we had to take um, to help limit, um, you know, limit the, the, um, the red tape and the hurdles that uh, we had to overcome. So for us, um, you know, when, when we were approached, uh, you know, by, uh, by FEMA to, you know, to, to ask if we wanted to, to go through with this, to make, uh, to basically, they asked if we wanted to become direct recipients because it was easier to go into the state. For us, it was about our sovereignty. Um, even though we were the first tribe in the region to, be, uh, to ever uh, request an emergency declaration, uh, we went ahead and, and worked around the clock. Um, and I sit here now in our emergency operations center um, over a year later of this COVID pandemic. And we are, um, you know, we're still moving forward, forward with submitting projects and helping the other tribes in our region and through across the country as well. Um, another thing besides the, uh, uh, the PA admin plans and the FEMA tribe agreement, um, you have to start applying for uh, disaster grant funding um, and you have to acquire access to what is known as, as the FEMA grants portal and your FEMA tribal um, liaison can, can help walk you through that. Um, it was, you know, kind of burdensome at first, but um, once you get the hang of it, um, it, you know, it's pretty simple. That information on the screen um, basically is a quick uh, walkthrough of the um, grants portal access and that's a screenshot from one of our, our projects. Um, so when you get to that, to that section, of your um, direct recipient process um, in your emergency declaration, um, you know, you'll, that'll become very familiar to you. Um, if you wanna just go on to the next slide, Kildy. So <clears throat> we were the first tribe, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, the first tribe, in, as I mentioned, in, in, uh, in FEMA's region one and the second in the country to become direct recipients under this national emergency declaration that we're still under for COVID-19. Um, we started um, before, you know, the president declared it as a as an emergency, as a national emergency. Um, and as I mentioned, we went uh, directly to FEMA and requested um, this assistance. Um, and it was about more of more of our sovereignty, as I mentioned. This is, you know, it's critical that you know you have everything in place, as Jeff had mentioned as well. You know, all of your plans. One of the the uh, the plans that you need is your emergency operations plan. Um, your FEMA tribal liaison can assist you with getting these things established, but we're here for that as well. And if anybody needs um, any guidance or, or templates or examples, um, I can share my, my contact information and I'd be more than willing to share um, some of the steps that we, uh, we went through for this process. Um, you wanna go to the next slide, please? So um, as I explained earlier, uh, we had a short list to go through. The PA admin plan was, um, was the biggest uh, step that we had to take. And then that, that FEMA tribe agreement was um, the next step. So having these um, already pre-scripted and ready to go is gonna be critical um, to become an, a direct recipient. So um, as I mentioned, anybody who needs any templates or, or any examples that we've, we've uh, already done to help alleviate any problems that you may have as you go through this process, um, please reach out to, uh, to Kelby and she can share that with you through me. Um, and we don't have an issue with sharing any of that. Um, Want to move to the next slide, please? So this was uh, the start of our emergency operations center activation. Uh, the gentleman sitting in the background of that picture, he's a FEMA uh, federal coordinating officer. So the region deployed an FCO here directly, uh, directly to assist us. Um, so his name was uh, Adam Burpee, and we now have uh, Regina Morado as a new, a new tribal liaison. But um, 
we took over the, the tribal council room and made that into our emergency operations center, which is, uh, is still active today. Um, so there, I mean, we're talking, you know, 14 hour days, um, you know, for six months straight without a day off just to get everything in place and started um, because tribes, um, as you all are aware, we don't have the same capacity. The large, majority of us don't, right? Compared to our state counterparts, we don't have all of the, the fundamentals that are needed, right? You need a operations section, logistics section, planning section. We do it all. Um, as the emergency management director or um, emergency manager for a tribe, you're responsible for keeping your, your tribal community safe and writing all the plans and, and leading um, the operations, especially when it comes to requesting uh, these de types of declarations, um, it's, you know, it's, it's cumbersome, but, you know, it, it can be done. Um, and hopefully down the road, we'll, you know, have some, some more federal, assi federal assistance where, you know, we, we have the funding to support all tribes um, through Congress. So uh, next slide, slide, please. And uh, this last slide basically just shows all of the steps that I described. This is the checklist I had on the wall that FEMA provided me. Um, everything we had to have in place and we did it in, uh, in, in sync and in unity. So, you know, one after the other, um, you know, weeks, weeks for each little step, you know, we, we made sure that we got all of our, our ducks in a row. Um, and that was the other day, 365 days. Um, so we were a full year into this um, in, our, in our emergency operations center and for this emergency declaration. So um, yeah, that's just a, a really brief overview. There's a lot more to this and hopefully that helped um, you know, explain the processes and, and some of the steps that are needed as you potentially move forward with your emergency uh, declaration. So, Kelby, I'll, I'll pass it back over. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Nelson. I'm going to hand it over to Dave Monroe, David Monroe, to um, talk a little bit more about uh, you know the overview of the Stafford Act and a lot of these issues regarding uh, major disaster declarations and emergency disaster declarations and some additional info from Homeland Security. So thanks so much, David. Thank you, Kelby. Um, one of the things that I was asked to do is, is share the larger picture of how the department uh, supports tribes and works to provide uh, support to tribes who need uh, assistance from the federal government and where different components of the department might have authorities. So not only with FEMA, which you were talking about today, but with our, our Customs and Border Protection, our, our United States Coast Guard, a Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, the Transportation Security Administration, uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, uh, and, and, and even uh, the Secret Service. So where they have authorities to provide assistance and how they can uh, help meet the needs uh, for tribes during times of disaster. There's a couple tools and a couple, uh, as I shared in my introduction, that I would I would bring up some of the things that the administration is doing. So a couple things that the administration is doing that are directly connected to uh, the department's strengthening of nation to nation relationships and ensuring that we're supporting tribes. Uh, where your support is needed and making sure that you can convey your request clearly to the department. So you've been over the past uh, two webinars and a quick snapshot today, you've been kind of provided the nuts and bolts of how the emergency and the major disaster declaration process works for uh, declarations from FEMA and, and you'll have some real life stories directly related to Alaska in a few minutes, um, but always keep in the back of your mind that sovereign relationship that you have in, in a nation to nation relationship with the federal government and the importance in letting the department and uh, federal federal folks like like me and our uh, political appointed leadership know uh, what your needs are, uh, because you know, we might sit back here in DC and think that we have the best ideas in the world, uh, but really we need to be doing what, what Indian country and what, what native Alaskan villages and, and tribes are, are asking us to do. Uh, so that, that's very important that you, you have a conduit to share uh, information and messaging with, um, you know, directly with the department. So on uh, January 26th, just a quick preview, uh, the president issued a memorandum uh, on strengthening the nation to nation relationships plural, uh, with tribes and on tribal consultation. So it has some requirements for the department to update its work plan to implement Executive Order 13175, consultation and coordination with tribal governments. And what that does is uh, establishes an accountable, timely, and meaningful process for consultation. 
Granted, that timeline itself doesn't give us you know, a, a long time to engage with tribes uh, in consultation, but we look forward to developing a work plan, not just this year uh, in working with tribes to develop that work plan, but in the out years also. See, the administration has a quick turnaround this year, uh, but we know that in the out years that we also have opportunities to add action plans. Where that's important is if we identify um, items directly related to disaster declarations, emergency preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation activities, all of the things that you're discussing today, uh, those are important. And then finally, I just want to address one section in Executive Order 13175 that is very important to uh, Alaska Native villages and tribes in Alaska, um, is Section 6, which talks about waivers. And it provides uh, federal agencies the authority to to consider waivers uh, for any statutory or regulatory requirement where we have that authority. So where if Congress provided us an authority to do something and then we created a regulation to implement that, um, and then if a, if a tribe you know, has a consideration that they would like to request a waiver from, um, you know, there's that opportunity to ask the federal government for relief to that requirement. So don't hesitate to use those opportunities or give me a call. Um, uh, or shoot me an email if there's anything that I can do to help you. So, so that's all, that's all that I wanted to bring to the table. And again, I, my primary primary mission here today is to listen and make sure that I'm uh, I'm up to speed on um, on the needs uh, up in Alaska. So, Robert, turn it back over to you, sir. Thanks, David. Um, there was a query about um, the different types of um, uh, things uh, that uh, tribes can access, different programs, different. Uh, types of uh, uh, recovery costs and that sort of thing. Uh, is there, and, but th there's also a question about the, um, the plans and the technical assistance that was, uh, that might be available that was mentioned. How do you go about getting that or who, or who provides that? Is that from FEMA or is that from, who is that from? So, so I'll, I'll take the technical assistance uh, piece. Um, as Nelson said, and, and, and I've, I've told many tribes before, uh, the technical assistance um, is you can get that from FEMA. Um, that is a, an arm that, or a, a tool that FEMA has that you, all, it, all I've ever done when I've needed technical assistance is contact my, my tribal liaison from that region. Um, and put that request in an email. And uh, then they work to get the, get the right people uh, to us. Um, but on the other side of that, as Nelson was describing, um, reaching out to, to tribes that, that you know of, reach out to NCAI, they can put you in touch with tribes that have experience on that. Um, uh, but re don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I am more than willing, I know Nelson is more than willing to uh, provide as much assistance as we can. And if we don't have the answers, we will definitely uh, find the right person for you to talk to. Uh, but but with with FEMA, get a hold of your tribal liaison and 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 put that request in for for technical assistance. Anyone else want to address um, that? Good, thank you. Um, and there was another query. And just about, a quick uh, uh, reminder for all the attendees. Oh, sorry, it's okay, Robert. Um, just a quick reminder for all of our attendees. If you could put questions in the chat, we'll make sure to answer them. Also, if you don't feel comfortable putting a question in the chat that everyone can see, please feel free to directly message me. Um, I'm happy to, at, Robert and I will be asking the questions of our panelists today. So I'm happy to keep your information confidential. Um, so don't feel like you can't ask a question in front of everybody. So we'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, with that being said, Robert, we did get a direct message question. And so the question says, you know, how, how would the speakers recommend going about starting your tribal emergency management program? My nation doesn't have a program. And so how, how do you actually start and build a program? And I know that both Jeff and Nelson have some good information on starting your tribal emergency management program. I, I can just give a quick synopsis of how we did it. And then um, I'm sure Jeff um, can fill in after so um so for us when when i when i started we had one generator uh one small grant through the state um so i i immediately realized that we needed to get additional funding right so um i i started looking into different grants one of the grants was the tribal homeland security grant program that was the first major grant we got um so these are you know these are grants that you can you can start working on yourself 
um, and ask your, you know, your female liaisons for assistance uh, in potentially uh, applying for, but you'll need permission from your tribal council. I had to explain what emergency management was to our, um, to our leadership, right? I, I had several meetings with our, our chairman and with our, um, our tribal council, and we brought in FEMA. We brought in the regional administrator. Um, they will come out and, and talk to your leadership. So it's, it's a leader to a leader, um, basically explaining the importance of having an emergency management department, um, basically building that foundation and then getting the trainings in place. There's a lot of free trainings um, that FEMA has, the incident command system, ICS trainings. You want to start with those to get a, be a good understanding of those and to, get, to start your foundation. Um, so the grant funding... Um, the, the trainings and getting permission from your, your tribe to even move forward with applying for these grants um, and also um, in, in teaching your, your tribal community on what emergency management is. Um, there are free resources you can get as well. Um, Indian Health Services has a program called Project Transam. That's how we started getting our first vehicles and, and generators and things like that to support the community. Um, so those are just a, a couple uh, glimpses into how we got started. Thank you. I, I would Thanks agree so much, with Nelson. that. Um, I, I, Nelson, I, I know, um, you know, built it from the ground up. And uh, I think that the big thing that I've been successful with, um, you know, following kind of the same pattern that Nelson did, um, grabbing grabbing whatever financial resources you can to uh, to begin building those resources, um, getting, getting people to uh, classes either at the Emergency Management Institute um, and going through the tribal curriculum or um, getting uh, classes like uh, what, what are being taught, you know, through LSU and the, uh, with, with Robert's stuff programs, um, getting people educated. Um, and then the, the biggest thing that, that I have think is always an opportunity is, is basically those windows of opportunity when something happens and you've got everybody's attention, um, whether that is a uh, a storm or, you know, some kind of disaster and you've got everybody's attention and that's when you really can get them hooked uh, into the need and, and shine and, and show what a, what a value that emergency management can bring to the decision makers for your tribes. Okay, uh, with that, um, Naomi, do we have um, Barrett's um, presentation queued up? If there's, unless there's any more questions. Yes, Robert, sorry. One person wanted to ask um, uh, some questions. And, and if you could ask one additional question, Robert, um, actually, sorry, uh, an individual sent a couple of questions to me via email and not over Zoom. And I just noticed that um, someone posted in the chat to check my email. So I'm checking my email right now. Um, okay. <laughs> so here, uh, here's a couple of questions. Um, oh, some great questions, actually. Uh, all questions are great, but um, these are some fantastic ones. So the first question is the HMP requirement for a disaster declaration. Um, Many Alaska villages do not have an approved HMP and therefore cannot use the tribal disaster declaration. What, all, what other alternatives might a tribe use after a disaster occurs? Um, and I know that's highly specific to um, uh, Alaska tribes. It might be better for us to ask that question um, after the next section, which is very Alaska focused. So I will uh, see if our speakers would like to, to hold off on that specific question until we get to the Alaska portion or if you'd like to answer it now. Hi, this is Ramona Van Cleve. I think holding off is great and I'm happy to answer it because there are some very specifics we'll talk about. Thank Perfect. you. And thank you so much to the person that sent uh, these questions. They are very, uh, they're all very Alaska specific. There's a lot of them. Um, just a reminder to everybody that um, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat. Of course, you can uh, send them to my email as well at kkennedyncai.org, but you're going to have to <laughs> ping me in the chat and tell me you sent me questions. Um, with that being said, I agree with Robert. If we don't have any other questions, uh, Naomi, if we don't have any other questions, let's start the video from Barrett. And that way we'll, we'll have more time to answer all these Alaska specific questions after the next section of the presentation. Hey everyone, I'm Barrett Ristroff. I'm a lawyer, planner, researcher, mediator, evaluator, working in Louisiana and Alaska. 
I'm on a plane right now, so you just have me as a video today. In this short video, I just want to give an overview of disaster challenges and strategies for Alaska Native villages, which are federally recognized tribes. The term also refers to the community where many of the tribal members are located. Later, you will hear from Alaskans who've actually been there on the ground in the aftermath of disasters. My perspective comes from my dissertation research that I did on this theme and also work that I've been doing for villages who are living with the slow moving disaster of climate change. First, I wanna explain why a focus on Alaska is relevant to this national conversation. One reason is the number of tribes situated here. Over 40% of federally recognized tribes are based in Alaska. Another issue is that Alaska is warming more rapidly than the lower 48. Many tribal communities are at risk of being lost due to erosion and permafrost melt. And we already know that what happens in Alaska doesn't stay in Alaska. Tribal communities in the lower 48 are already being hit hard by climate change and related disasters, from hard freezes to droughts to floods and fires. And this is only likely to get worse in the coming years. Now I want to explain some specific challenges that Alaska Native villages face. All tribes have limited financial resources, but those in Alaska are particularly limited by their small size. Particularly in the interior of Alaska, there are some villages with only a handful of people left. Most tribes don't own their land, and they have no recognized sovereignty over it. There's only one reservation in Alaska akin to those in the lower 48. Alaska Native corporations do own some of this land, but these are not the same as tribes. They don't have sovereignty. And they don't have any authority in the event of a disaster. You can see from the map how remote these communities are. Most of them are far from the road system such that you have to fly in. You can imagine how this would complicate disaster response, let alone just getting in basic goods and services. With the remoteness and lack of land base, there's very little in the way of local economies. There are no casinos. And since there is no land base, they are not eligible to be part of the National Flood Insurance Program, which could help rebuild after a flood. Even if they were, they may not have the capacity to administer this program. Despite the 2013 amendment to the Stafford Act allowing tribes to ask for presidential declarations, this has not occurred in Alaska. It's simply easier to go through the state, which will pay the 25% cost share that no tribe can afford to pay. I mentioned that some villages will need to move toward higher ground away from the shore, whether they're situated on rivers or coastlines. A presidential disaster declaration and the funding that this brings is an opportunity to make this happen. Both Alatna and Eagle Village in interior Alaska were able to relocate to higher ground through disaster declarations. Eagle's relocation was previously planned, but would have proceeded much more slowly without disaster aid. Alakakit is across the river from Alatna. Both were almost washed away in the 1994 flood. But Alakakit was not able to complete its relocation to higher ground. Only half of the village has moved up the hill, leaving people at risk in the floodplain. The separation is inconvenient. The school is still in the floodplain. All the other facilities are more than a mile away and few people have vehicles. And this impedes social cohesion. I've been working with Alakakit with funding from a BIA resilience grant to gather information and community input that would be needed to apply for a FEMA BRIC grant to relocate buildings that might be moved and to buy out those that can't. There's a need for meetings to figure out who wants to move and what's the feasibility of moving or buying out each house. New Talk is projected to be underwater by 2027. Since erosion and permafrost melt don't qualify as disasters, under the Stafford Act, this village, like Kivalina, Shishmaraf, and Shaktulik, have not gotten the disaster declaration funding that would enable a move. A previous request for a disaster declaration under the Obama administration was denied. Newtok got land on higher ground from its native corporation. It received some limited funds from a congressional appropriation and in the last few years has been able to build critical infrastructure and enough housing to provide for about a third of the community at the new site but there's still significant overcrowding. New Talk is aiming to complete the move through brick buyouts and mitigation projects, BIA home improvement projects, and funding through foundations. 
New Talk also has a housing policy that once put in place would set up a system where residents at the new site pay a certain percentage of their income into a housing fund that is used to build additional houses. If a tribe can get a disaster declaration through the state and not have to manage it, you might wonder why would a tribe even need to prepare for disasters. One reason is to avoid what some people call disaster colonization, the idea of outside officials coming in and imposing things on the community that they may not have wanted. Alaska Native villages and other tribes may have particular values and needs that can get lost in the shuffle. One of them here in Alaska is subsistence, which can be somewhat outside the realm of FEMA. In fact, there's an entirely different disaster regime under the state and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for fishing and subsistence disasters. But FEMA can provide some support for restoring subsistence infrastructure through what is known as other needs assistance. If tribal members are already familiar with the disaster declaration process and have the skill set, they could potentially help with the disaster recovery. If the community has a vision of what they would want to do in the event of a disaster, like rebuild in a different place or build back in a different way, this could avoid wasted effort. Here's an example. In the rush to return people to Alakakit after the 1994 flooding disaster, temporary homes, in quotes, were rebuilt right in the floodplain, and 25 years later, these have basically become permanent homes. It may be that the tribe wants to have some sort of formal disaster recovery plan, and this doesn't have to be something glossy and expensive done by a consultant. It could just be as simple as a resolution and a map showing where rebuilding will occur and where it won't, maybe some guidelines for how the new infrastructure will be. As far as plans go, unfortunately, there is a lot of money out there for planning and not a lot of money for doing things to carry out these plans. There's a whole industry of consultants and nonprofits working with tribes to take advantage of planning grants provided by BIA and the Environmental Protection Agency. The end result is usually a climate change adaptation plan that's just a big report, never integrated with other plans and never used. If you get one of these grants, my recommendation is to use it for the legwork that you'll need to get a grant that can carry out an actual project like moving a building. A lot of climate change adaptation and disaster planning and recovery is really about construction. I recommend that tribes take advantage of, of FEMA's BRIC funding. For those that aren't familiar with BRIC, this is the program that replaced the pre-disaster mitigation program. It has more money than the previous program. Tribes can apply as sub-applicants through the state or go tribal direct. There is a cost share for tribal direct, but it's reduced to 10% for small and impoverished communities. Money is set aside specifically for Tribal Direct, so it can be easier to get. There are also other grants that provide for housing, like the BIA Housing Improvement Program and the Indian Block Community Development Grant, although in Alaska, this latter grant typically has to go through a regional housing authority. I have a list here of certain documents that the tribe probably wants to have ahead of a disaster, particularly if it's thinking it would manage the disaster on its own. So a plan for managing a hazard mitigation grant, a plan for how to manage public assistance from a disaster, indicating what kind of assistance a tribe would want after a disaster, like other needs assistance, and a plan for managing that other needs assistance if the tribe wants to do this on its own instead of having FEMA do it. I can be a little down on outside driven plans, but a tribe definitely needs a hazard mitigation plan to get most FEMA grants. This is one case where a bad plan is better than no plan at all. The state of Alaska can work with communities to provide hazard mitigation plans for free, but a tribe needs to be proactive and make sure that the state works with the tribe in addition to the municipality that may be associated with that village. If the tribe is gonna be the recipient of grants, it's not enough that the city associated with the village has a plan. If there is a city that does have a plan, in that case, the tribe should have a joint plan with the city. You'll hear from Ramona Van Cleve, who is a real asset to FEMA and does not need any suggestions from me. I make these suggestions in the spirit of helping those who maybe have not previously worked with Alaska Native Villages. Again, I want to emphasize the importance of local labor. It would be great to consider what functions could be performed by residents themselves rather than flying in FEMA workers to and from the disaster site each day. 
Another idea is for FEMA to develop a video or a video series that could be watched on a smartphone or on a disc to explain how the disaster declaration and recovery process works. And maybe this already exists. It's just important to keep in mind that internet bandwidth is really limited in the villages. Finally, cultural sensitivity training could be useful for those who are likely to be involved in disaster response in tribal communities. Unfortunately, I am not there in person for questions and discussion, but please contact me and keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. So as Barrett said, we will definitely be keeping the conversation going. Um, thank you, you know, thank you to Barrett. I know that she's probably going to rewatch um, this presentation on the NCAI YouTube channel later. I think that was some really fantastic information and I'll hand it over to Robert before we move on uh, to our next speaker. Robert? Um, actually, I was thought that's what I thought you were doing, but we'll proceed. And uh, Brian Ridley, uh, you're on the docket, my friend. Um, I just want to cover in the PowerPoint that the TCC region that I work in uh, covers 235,000 square miles or 37% of the state of Alaska, just smaller than the state of Texas. Um, as I said before, we've got 37 federally recognized tribes. Um, about a quarter are on the road system, but that leaves three quarters not on the road system. Um, so you can only get there by air or boat in the summer or snow machine in the winter. Uh, next slide. I'll go through a quick uh, summary uh, on the next slide of uh, we first got introduced to uh, disaster response in the 2009 spring breakup flooding. Then in 2012, uh, we had a major windstorm um, in Tanacross. Then in 2013, uh, we had spring breakup flooding again. And then in 2015, uh, we had a lot of wildfires covering the entire state. Uh, next slide. I've got a bunch of pictures for, I think it's the next 10 slides and this first picture is my tribe, Eagle, which flooded in 2009. Um, we weren't involved at that point with uh, disaster response. And I read in the paper that there were 15,000 pounds of freight trying to get to Eagle and they couldn't get it there. Uh, so I talked to my boss, uh, the chief chairman of TCC. We um, chartered a C-46, which to me was like a B-52 bomber that could move 15,000 pounds of freight all at once. And we got it out there. Um, I learned at that point uh, better if people are wanting to donate, to donate money, um, because people will clean out their closets and donate all sorts of uh, old items and you end up with a lot of uh, freight that needs to get moved. Um, whereas uh, monetary, you can focus uh, to specific needs. I can't emphasize enough the behavioral health component on disasters, uh, not just for the individuals that are impacted, but also for the responders. Um, I think back to this disaster uh, where one of the toughest women I knew uh, who once pulled her own tooth out there in Eagle with a Leatherman, um, was crying on my shoulder after about two weeks of dealing with this. It's, it's tough to get through um, and really hard to explain. Um, the big silver roof there is uh, my family's, my mom's cabin. Um, the roof with the flags, that was our fish cache. Uh, next slide. So this is the road uh, between the Eagle City and the village, uh, about a mile and a half below the village right here. Um, we helped uh, with a temporary road uh, until all this ice and everything could be cleared. Uh, we helped with uh, getting the electricity back up and running because there were about a mile and a half to two miles of electric poles that were taken out from all the ice. Um, learning process uh, when we helped the for-profit electric company get back up and running um, we didn't get reimbursed for that because FEMA doesn't reimburse for for-profit entities um, so knowing the purchase process what's allowed what's not um, I think FEMA's got some um, books on that that really runs through uh, the procurement process 
Um, another thing, you know, you can kind of see from this picture is there was a lot of cleanup required and uh, we were wanting to get as many locals working, uh, native and non-native. Um, and uh, I believe FEMA had said, you know, local hire or native hire wasn't a huge uh, priority of FEMA specifically. Um, and so when the contract was awarded to a union contractor, what we did was we worked with the unions to um, get a lot of locals um, into that so that they were working in it. And it ended up being a win-win for everybody involved. Uh, one procurement as a CFO that I have to bring up um, issue we ran into was we needed uh, two four-wheelers and two meat trailers to move freight on the temporary road. Uh, so we spent about 10 grand for two used four-wheelers and, and two used trailers. And when um, we were working with FEMA, um, they said, well, you can't buy equipment, uh, but we can rent the equipment from TCC. So they were willing to pay 20 to $30,000 of rent instead of paying $10,000 on the purchase. Um, and I said, well, that doesn't make fiscal sense to me. And uh, I was told, well, the federal government doesn't always do what makes fiscal sense. So I say that as a learning experience because it really kind of surprised me. Uh, but some of the ins and outs of the procurement, uh, it, uh, definitely a learning curve. Uh, next slide. This next slide shows you really what we were dealing with. Uh, 15 feet thick of ice that came through and completely wiped out our village. Um, you can see some of the heavy equipment that uh, got completely crushed through it. Um, again, learning experience. One of the biggest frustrations we had or our people had was filling out the damage assessments uh, with the state uh, SEOC. And then when enough damage was uh, put together uh, to make it go federal, so a FEMA declaration, then they had to completely redo the uh, damage assessment with FEMA. And so I've always advocated time and time again, if we could get the state and FEMA working together because these poor people um, are devastated at that point and having to go through that process twice in uh, a month um, is just really hard on them. Uh, the other piece being individual assistance. Um, at that time, I think it was around 32,000. I had heard, uh, up to 34,000 maybe on helping um, rebuild homes, which isn't nearly enough to uh, replace the home. And so uh, what we had done was the Mennonites and Samaritans purse um, chipped in, BOAD, which uh, Red Cross is a part of, chipped in, and we were able to uh, get the houses replaced. And so we were really happy with that. Um, my advocacy piece would be uh, some sort of a COLA option where uh, a house might, uh, you might be able to get replace a house in the lower 48 um, for 32, 34,000. But in Alaska, that just covers the freight to get it out there. And so some way of uh, equity or fairness um, so that if, if uh, lower 48 um, is able to replace a house, uh, a, a larger payment or something in Alaska um, so that they're able to replace houses as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, quick picture of uh, down in the city, uh, ice uh, about 40 feet above normal. Um, as part of the cleanup, one of the most stressful parts was in order for individuals to get assistance, uh, their houses had to be ground up and boy, I had a lot of uh, elders crying uh, over that. Uh, another learning experience was uh, that <clears throat> FEMA doesn't assist religious organizations. So our church, which had church services, weddings, funerals, um, we had no assistance with that. Luckily, uh, about maybe six or eight years later, the church was able to come through and help replace that. So that was good. Um, another issue we ran into was the entire graveyard being wiped clean and not even knowing where the grave markers needed to go. Um, that was another uh, huge issue that we dealt with. The other piece to uh, stand your ground, uh, if something doesn't feel right on the response, um, the Army Corps of Engineers had come in and said uh, they wanted to put up, uh, we called it a tent, 
they called it a soft-sided structure. Um, now keep in mind, I went to school here at 69 below because 70 below was our cutoff. Um, we said a tent just isn't gonna work. Um, after the tent filled up with water from the fall rains, they said, hey, maybe you guys are right. And they sent us a temporary trailer um, and it ended up working out in the end. Next slide. Uh, here's just below that, uh, them trying to clear the ice. Uh, what did we learn from this? That TCC is uh, more of an initial responder. We deal with the EVAC, food and water, and shelter primarily. And in the case of an EVAC, if we're flying people into town, into Fairbanks, um, keeping registration sheets and contact info of everybody coming in, um, having greeters there to greet the people and drivers to help uh, drive them wherever they needed to go um, was really important. Um, the part I have to emphasize here is we worked on an MOA after all this with the State Emergency Operations Center, um, and that has really come in handy uh, for TCC. After Eagle, we went around prepping the other villages, and in our other village of Hughes, an elder had told us about uh, his cabin being uh, chained off or cabled off, and, and I said, well, why would you do that? And he said, well, because last time it flooded, I went to sleep and I was looking at the river out my front window. And when I woke up, I was looking at the mountain behind the village. His cabin literally lifted and he would have floated down the river had it not been cabled off. Next slide. Uh, this is the 2012 Tanacross windstorm. <clears throat> As I said, this was our first experience using fire crews to help clear trees. Luckily, most of the damage in Tanacross was to roof metal, and we were able to quickly replace that after clearing all the downed trees. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can see uh, estimates uh, for Tanacross were that the winds were 100 miles an hour that came through there uh, and just kind of a freak windstorm. Uh, next slide. We've got the 2013 Galena flood. Um, the first slide is the fuel storage you can see there. Um, and I have to uh, say Galena specifically at the very start for us as responders, one of the most stressful times in deciding to evacuate or not go or no go. I got a call from uh, my boss at eight o'clock at night on go or no go. <clears throat> and it was a $50,000 decision to charter planes and evacuate the people in Galena. And it's hard because if it doesn't actually become a big enough disaster, that's all on the tribe or in this case, TCC. Um, and it's really a tough time at the very start when it hasn't quite actually happened. Um, luckily, uh, we haven't lost any lives through any of our disasters. So we've been pretty lucky so far. And while we were trying to decide to go or no go, they were boating through the streets, dodging icebergs, and not everybody had time to even get a life jacket. Uh, that was how fast it came in. Next slide. So this next slide shows uh, a good overview of Galena. Um, we've got the school up at the top in blue and white. We've got the clinic uh, just down and to the left. We've got uh, the fuel tanks kind of in the middle there, the big silver uh, tanks. Did the slide change? <laughs> um, and right above the fuel tanks, uh, you can see the sewage lagoon um, right above the fuel tanks uh, that flooded. And finally at the bottom of that next slide is the elder facility with the big blue roof um, right on the banks um, and that did actually flood. So if we can go to the next slide showing the fire response in 2015 and all the smoke. Um, the 2015 wildfires covered the entire state. Um, I'll just say on fire response, it was our first one where we were dealing with the state fire agency as the primary responder. And the hardest part was not being able to move people or supplies for three to four days because of the smoke. 
you always have a plan A, but you got to have a plan B and C when A doesn't work. And like I just said about the fires, that's what happened to us. Um, not being able to move anything for three to four days. My motto is always plan for the worst, but hope for the best. You can't over plan or be over prepared. Uh, plan early when the disaster is happening. That's too late to be trying to plan anything. Um, exercise the plan. Tabletop exercises are good. And remember kids, pets, and elders. And I have to emphasize pets because we e evacuated a lot of dogs out of Galena when they flooded. Next slide. I just wanna emphasize the use of the incident command system and how important it is during a disaster. It works, but what we found is you have to personalize it to your needs. So if you look at the next slide, here's a copy of our chart I won't go through it in detail, uh, but it's taken a lot of uh, redrafting and whatnot to get it to where it's useful for us. It changes there in the bottom middle, whether or not we're evacuating anyone or not. Um, we found generators and sat phones for communications are, are usually pretty important. And this came in important during COVID. We sent out a lot of cots and sleeping bags for quarantine shelters at the start of the pandemic. And we made masks that were sent out to the villages. And it's also come in pretty handy for the testing and vaccine rollout. Next slide. Um, one of the most helpful things I think you can do is having a small community emergency response plan or CERT for short. The state has draft uh, a blank plans that your tribe can fill in. And ever since we got involved, we pushed our uh, tribes to use that. And we've got most, but not all uh, that have those. And on the next slide, you'll see a copy of the book. Uh, TCC covers the first 72 hours, as I said, so the red or green section on up. And usually after that is where we hand it off to the state SEOC and to FEMA. And the next slide, I just wanted to finish and say, Masi Cho, thank you for your time. And this is a view from my cabin in Eagle um, at breakup. The bank at my cabin is about 60 feet. And the 2009 flood came within about two feet of coming over the bank there. And uh, you can see uh, this flood or this breakup went out really smoothly and there was actually caribou riding the ice downriver. So that's it for my presentation. I'll hand it back over, I believe, to Ramona. Yeah, hi. So good morning. And one nice thing about sort of following everybody else's conversation, I want to spend just a little time bringing it all back together and and kind of see what our steps can be. How can we position our tribes to be successful when we have a disaster? You heard of a lot of the things that were going on and lots of suggestions. And I wanna to talk to tribes now about the kind of resources, the things they need to think about, a little bit of homework, if you will. You will need to think about your ability to provide staffing, and this is even more critical if you have a direct declaration. It is true, as someone mentioned, when we come in, we come in very large, and that's difficult for a tribe that might have just a few people. So if you can get at least a couple that are dedicated to that connection to FEMA, kind of consider that as that liaison, as I am to you, that would really help. I definitely want to touch on the cost share, and I saw that this came from Joel um, and a shout out to Akiak. The cost share is written in the law right now and standard is 75.25, but that doesn't mean it will be for a small and what I consider, when we say impoverished, I mean financially impoverished because tribes have so much other stuff that really tying to the finances. We can go 90-10 on a direct declaration, but that's not guaranteed at the start of a disaster. At the start, the tribal leadership, that chief or president is agreeing in their FEMA state agreement that they will fund their 15, their 25%. I know that's difficult to agree to in the beginning, 
but that's just kind of how it works right now. And if you've worked with me at all, you know that I'm very straight up at what it is. And then I try to look for answers for you. I do want to point out if you do things in a direct declaration, keep super good records. And I'm talking about your in-kind things you've done, personnel that you have provided, equipment you may have used, voluntary agency time for people who have come in to help you. Keep track of all that. And then I have a little small eye on the slide for insurance. I know in Alaska Native Villages, having insurance is almost next to none and through no fault of the tribes. It's either you can't get it or it's so costly that the people cannot feed their family and buy the insurance. Insurance is wonderful to have. It's just, we understand that's a huge difficulty. And I did talk about that small and impoverished 90, 10 cost share. So if you would go to the next slide, I want to start working on how we can position you to be successful. The administrative requirements are burdensome and it's not just FEMA. If you've worked with any federal agency, you know there is a lot. So again, I wanna go back to dedicated personnel. You would need your public works people or somebody who knows your tribal owned infrastructure. You would need to have people that can make leadership decisions. That FEMA state agreement that the tribal and FEMA agreement, I'm sorry, that is a legal document. So it does take attorneys to be sure that what you're signing is what you agree to. And then I wanna to touch on those required plans that I really appreciate others, Nelson and Jeff and others offering to share. The public assistance administrative plan is required so that you can get infrastructure replaced or repaired. So we have to have that plan and it is quite a large effort. I would say, reach out to me, let's get you that sample if you want to go this way. The individual assistance, what I call the simplified plan, the simplified plan is just, you have agreed that these are the things we would cover. And let me give you an example. Under individual assistance, families may have lost critical personal property that in Alaska may not be the same as what they might need, say in a city in the lower 48. Maybe it was your hunting rifle, which is critical for our survival up here. Maybe it was something else, a snow machine. Snow machines, for most people outside of Alaska, not all, would be more of a luxury item or a toy. For us, it is transportation. So those are the things that we talk about in the individual simplified pan. Here's what you agree that should be covered. Now, that hazard mitigation plan, and I do want to touch on Joel, what he said. Um, it is a requirement. There is no way around it at this time, but I want to give you a resource in order to help you write it. And then they've already mentioned the small community emergency response plan. Think of that as a step one to learn more about your village, more about the people who can help and how they can respond. You're very fortunate in some areas if you have a Tanana Chiefs Conference out in Western Alaska, you would have Association of Village Council Presidents. They, of course, are going to help. They're going to be there for you, but your small community emergency response plan is your immediate go-to on who can do what. If you'd go to the next slide, please. So let's talk about some steps I would take if I worked for you, and I do, I am a tribal liaison, and as I always tell people, I work for the tribes, but FEMA just pays my salary. So keep in mind, if you reach out to me and say, Ramona, how would we get started? These next few slides are things I would really suggest. Tribal leadership should assign some people and they should take the tribal curriculum. Now the tribal curriculum, if you go to our Emergency Management Institute, yes, it's all the way to Maryland, but FEMA will reimburse your plane ticket we will provide your lodging. We will do everything but buy your meal ticket for that. And it's worthwhile. We even will pay an extra day for your travel, knowing that you can't always get from where we are in this state to EMI, to Maryland, just in an easy jump on a plane and go. 
as most of you would know. This curriculum, starting with the 580 requirement and taking the rest is so important. And one of the most important would be that mitigation for tribal governments, that hazard mitigation. But I wanna point out something that's real important. And I don't know if Chief Williams is still on. I hope so, Mike, that you're there. We need tribal leadership. We need them to take that emergency management overview. That's not a very long course. You don't have to go all the way to EMI for it, but you need that so that the leaders can tell their staff, this is what I want you to do. I want to create a robust emergency management. Now, if you could go to the next slide for me, I wanna talk about some things you can do for free on your own time. And it's not easy, as you know, up here. It's harder to get connectivity. It's harder to be connected and do that when you have a little bit of staff doing several jobs. But let's think about the priorities. These four I have listed are real basic language for working with government. Working with government in the emergency management. Never let a government, federal government person or a state government person speak to you in a language you don't understand. We don't mean to, we all start to talk in acronyms. Please stop us. But if you take these four basic courses, they each take maybe a couple hours to go through, you then know that language. And when we know language, we're part of something. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. So if you could go to the next slide, please. The SCRP, we already had that mentioned before. You can go to Ready Alaska for the toolkit. Please do that. But here's why I think it's more important than you know. It's not only that you have the step-by-step, -step, what do I do in the first few hours? but you then build that relationship with the state of Alaska. And the state of Alaska is a very unique situation. They pay, if you go through them for a disaster, they pay your 25% cost share. I think that's the biggest reason tribes have not gone direct at this point. It's the amount of money. A simple example could be a million dollar bridge to repair. FEMA would pay, if it becomes a federal declaration, $750,000, and the state would pay the two hundred and fifty. dollars Many tribes that I work with, and I work with 229 up in Alaska, don't have that kind of money. So extrapolate that. What if it's a $10 million disaster and it's $2.5 million? Even if you eventually get the 90-10 cost share, that's still a million dollars on that event. Now, some things I want you to know is that FEMA in Alaska is not a response agency. We have four staff up here and we don't have any critical assets such as a helicopter or a plane for evacuation. If you have an event, not only call your AVCP or Tanana chiefs or, or whoever you kind of support you in your area that's not for profit, but you call the state of Alaska Emergency Operations Center, and I'll drop that phone number in the chat. They can get access. They're in the military. They are able to, even though it's a civilian air arm event, they're able to get a helicopter if they need to. When we evacuated Alakakit and Alatna, it was the state of Alaska that used the assets to get them to Fairbanks. I want to talk about tribes helping tribes. The best you can do. And the best work I've seen is learning from the experience of the other tribes, like Brian pointed out, borrowing from Nelson Andrews, who's willing to share what a plan looks like, reach out to your tribe down the river, so to speak, here in Alaska, because we have many tribes on the river, that they can be your next evacuation point if they're not impacted, or they can be your support if you need them to come over and do something work with your tribes. You're all kind of family in the sense that you know what it's like. You know what it's like to be out there and be on your own. You have done emergencies and disasters for as long as you've been around as tribes. So use that and take advantage of it. We also would connect you with voluntary organizations. 
as Brian pointed out, they helped rebuild the village of Eagle, would never have made it just on the FEMA grant alone, but all of them coming together did that. They have sent food out to AVCP area and other items for, for the villages during COVID. They're there to help you. I want you to take one step at a time. So if you would, if you're not there yet, do the SCRP, number one, take the incident commands, number two, look for staff that can take that tribal curriculum and be your go-to people, number three. And if you change the slide, I wanna tell you number four, which is a big lift. So there's the things that I asked you to do. And that number four, that fourth bullet, apply to FEMA to get a grant to write your hazard mitigation plan. Now that hazard mitigation plan can be written with a grant, can be refreshed with a grant, or if you, I'm so sorry. And it allows you to get other opportunities for projects. We have a set aside, if you go to the next slide, I wanna to touch on for the tribe. In 2020, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, which is our goal, and to recover well from unfortunate events, the funding can build tribal capacity. There is a $600,000 non-competitive set aside per tribe. And in that set aside, you can get the funding. We need a grant writer. So hopefully you can reach out to your partners who have either a grant writer in your village or other grant writers, but you can get money to write the plan from that $600,000 set aside. And once you have a FEMA approved and a tribal adopted plan, you can get project funding. And I wanna give you an example. If you wanted to change a culvert because the other one's too small and the road to the airport is bad and it floods out spring and fall, you can actually get money in the $600,000 set aside to write the scope of the project, to help you scope out that project. And then you would be positioned to get a bigger grant from us through that brick. Now we haven't put out a notice of funding opportunity yet for this year, but normally it comes out in October. And I'm hoping that you will start thinking about that and getting ready. If you go to the next slide, please. I think the best thing you can do is ask the questions, start with the basics, don't expect that you're necessarily ready for the direct declaration today, but make that the goal on your wall. When you post, just like you saw earlier, where he had his list of responsibilities to do and worked 14 hour days every day for literally months to get ready, we don't have to do it that way if we start now. So I'm here for you to help you get lined out if that's how you wanna go, as you think you would like to go direct, but I'm also here for you to get you lined out. So even if you go through the state, you own your event and you'll be prepared to own that event. I'm sorry that bad happens to good people. We know it does, but I think we should really keep the conversation going as Barrett said, and I appreciate your time. We have spring break up around the corner. That's a really critical time for Alaska Villages. And that SCRP, I wanna point out, that Small Community Emergency Response Plan, any tribe in the nation can use that template just as a good talking point to get started when they come around the table to do things. So I will put the phone number for the state in the chat. You have my direct line there and my email. And I thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure we'll now go into taking some of those questions and see, we may not get to answer all of them. Some are pretty um, technical, but Joel, I appreciate the questions. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Ramona. Uh, I think Brian had a couple of follow-ups or at least a follow-up, Brian. Yes, and I apologize. Uh, when my slide on Galena uh, wouldn't change, it threw me off a little bit. 
And, and it really relates to a lot of what Ramona was talking about. Um, when Galena flood happened, um, the Stafford Act had just been changed. And so TCC and Galena were under heavy pressure to de declare directly with the feds. Um, but because of our relationship with the state of Alaska and them willing to uh, take all that on uh, and the cost share, 25% piece, um, it was kind of a no brainer for us to just keep going through the state. And like Ramona said, that's why um, they haven't had any, I don't believe to date. Um, for an example, had Galena declared directly to the feds and the cost share waiver wasn't granted, Galena would have been on the hook for $20 million um, of cost share funding. Um, and so back to advocacy, um, we're constantly uh, trying to advocate for a full cost share waiver for the tribes. Um, uh, the other part I would emphasize is the fact that we've got the MOU with the state um, that they allow us to be the initial responders. So other tribes um, or uh, regional uh, nonprofits like TCC can do that similar thing. So working with the state SEOC on that. I'm also told um, the state has funding to have contractors assist tribes with doing their hazard mitigation plan. Um, so that's another funding source um, in addition to the federal side that Ramona talked about. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have several questions in the queue. Um, I'm going to start with these. Uh, with, we'll see what we can plow through these. And these are for any of the presenters. Um, the hazard mitigation plan requirement for this tribal disaster declaration. Many Alaska villages do not have approved HMPs and therefore cannot use the tribal disaster declaration. What other alternatives might a tribe use after a disaster occurs? Any thoughts, please? Yes, Robert. Hi, this is Ramona. A couple of things. One is they could still go to direct, even if they don't have the hazard mitigation plan yet, but they couldn't get permanent works done until the plan is built. And it can actually be built at the very beginning of a disaster. That is not optimum. I don't recommend it. Unfortunately, the plan is a requirement, but I want to go back to let's take advantage of that brick funding that's set aside for tribes. I do want to point out that most tribes did not apply for that brick funding, that 600,000 set aside just for that tribe. We didn't have very many tribes in Alaska or I believe in the region, but some did. So the plan is required, but you can get emergency protective measures immediately and debris removal. You cannot get the permanent repair without the plan, but you can build a plan and have it approvable shortly after a declaration. And we would work with you immediately if that was the way you were going to go. Thank you. Uh, Robert, I would also include, you know, and I think David would be a good resource for this as well, the other agencies in the federal government that have programs um, available. So USDA has uh, funding opportunities that are disaster specific. Um, there is the CDBG um, disaster um, grants that are available. Um, there is a, there's actually a grant within CDBG. It's not a huge amount, uh, but it is an imminent threat grant that is funded um, every year. And so if you have a disaster and it's, and you can show the imminent threat, you can, you know, try to do some things uh, through those grants as well. Um, so there are options outside of FEMA. Um, and it, it's just a matter of, uh, uh, reaching out and, and uh, start exploring some of those other um, agencies within the, the federal government. And, and also you have the nonprofits uh, who are active in disaster. Um, I think Brian had mentioned the uh, um, Mennonites, uh, which are very, very active uh, in disasters and are a great resource. So. Great. Uh, next question is, is about mixture of city owned and tribal owned infrastructure. It is my understanding that FEMA will fund disaster response, recovery, and mitigation based upon an approved 
hazard mitigation plan and who owns the assets. In rural Alaska, it is not uncommon to have a city own some portion of the community infrastructure and the tribe own other infrastructure. If a tribe has an approved HMP and the city does not, are there opportunities for the tribe to include the city owned community infrastructure as part of a tribal disaster declaration? For example, if the city owns the power plant, electrical grid, and it has been damaged, can a tribe include this in the declaration as critical infrastructure for getting our community back to normal? Or does the state have to step in and declare a disaster for the non-tribally owned community infrastructure? So Robert, I'd like to at least to touch on this too. No, the tribe couldn't get the city work done under the tribal declaration in the pilot guidance. But I do think the city and tribe must work really closely together to decide if a tribe goes to direct, all of the damages in that area that are tribal get removed from the overall disaster that might happen for the state. It could be the make or break point if the city stuff wasn't quite enough to get a full declaration, but the tribal stuff, which has a little bit different criteria could get their own. Maybe adding the tribe with the city and going to the state makes both of them better. So it's something we would want to talk about a little bit further. I believe that might have came from our friends. Joel, I'd like to see it be that easy, but really at this time in the pilot guidance, it is not. And hopefully we'll discuss more about getting policy adjustments as time goes on. And, and we also deal with this in Oklahoma, the, the tribes here, um, you know, we have we have local jurisdictions mixed within our reservation. Um, and, and it's the same same way, same impl implementation here. Um, it is a consideration that we have to take every time. And, and it, that is, uh, if we go direct, uh, how is that going to impact our local local jurisdiction neighbor? Um, are they going to be able to to get a declaration or not? So. There are some political uh, considerations that do have to be taken in uh, into consideration. So, um, but I, I know in the past that effort um, that, that Joel is asking about the city going as a maybe even a sub recipient to the tribe um, that has been uh, attempted and 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 failed. But uh, it is something that we are, we continue to make recommendations to FEMA uh, to to adjust uh, the regulations and. Um, um, make that available, uh, hopefully someday in the future. Okay, good. Um, we've got uh, time for a couple more. Um, cost share match. Many villages do not have a tax base or other form of economic income, such as tourism, mining, casinos, or other revenue generating opportunities. Without a tax base, the small Alaska tribes may have problems coming up with a required 10% cost share match. What thoughts do your panelists have on this? I think it was previously mentioned, but let's go over it again, please. So hi, Robert, this is Ramon again, and sorry, I keep jumping in first, but I hear the FEMA piece of this. As of right now, the small and impoverished potential is 90-10. I think that's a much bigger policy thing. I would be on any side of a tribe putting in policy to try to get 100% federal share. But keep in mind when you plan for today, let's just use if it happened today, 75-25 is the standard. We definitely would work with you on trying to get the 90-10. And until we get a bigger guidance and policy congressional change, that's the most I can offer. And I wouldn't want to set any tribe up thinking today that we would give them 100%. Even back in the Alakakit and Alatna days for the state, they were able to get an 85, 15% cost share in the 90s because it was such a huge event. But as of now, 75, 25, and 90, 10 as the potential for small and impoverished. Robert, can I jump in as well? Absolutely. Uh, so you already heard um, what I had to say on cost share. Uh, really, under the current structure, if the state's willing to step in and cover the 25%, it just makes sense. Um, I told you before um, that in Galena on that one instance, they would could have been on the hook. Their 25% would have been 20 million. 
um, even under this better scenario, um, under 10%, they still would have been on the hook for 8 million. Um, so uh, at least so far, it, it hasn't made sense. Um, I'll kind of caveat that with a lot of this uh, COVID funding this last year, it does sound like that waiver has taken place. So that's a little different thing um, than the flooding or fires or other normal, I guess you could say, disasters that we're dealing with. Um, so uh, we'll continue to try to advocate uh, with NCAI and other tribes um, for a full waiver for tribes. Uh, but until that happens, at least in the state of Alaska, it doesn't make sense to me financially to put a tribe on the hook for um, 25 or even 10 um, in some of these large events. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jeff and Nelson, can I have you weigh in on this? Sure, I can, I can jump in a little bit about, about what we're, um, we're experiencing now. So um, during the, the initial part of the, the uh, um, COVID national emergency declaration, um, we had requested to the, the previous president to, um, for a um, you know, 100% cost share waiver, waiver adjustment. Um, we submitted letters and we actually had our, our state senators um, send letters as well. Um, and there weren't any approvals. Uh, so shortly after Biden had come in, um, as Brian had mentioned a little while ago, um, you know, we, we, we did receive that 100%, um, you know, cost share amendment waiver on this current disaster. And what that looks like for us now is um, all of the projects that we have submitted through our FEMA um, public assistance grants portal, um, we've been able to get um, the 25% remainder back. And any new projects um, that we have, we've submitted after January, um, those were, were put through as 100% cost share waiver. Um, I, I do recall in the past, though, um, having to go ahead and, and submit a, um, for, for FEMA grants, um, but we had to submit a 90-10, um, you know, cost share uh, waiver for a small impoverished community as Ramona had um, had mentioned. So that's always the option, but, um, you know, at least under this new administration, you know, that, you know, we're able to get 100% um, cost share waiver because it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to tribes to have to go ahead and, and do this on their own and, and try to cover the costs. So that this is, you know, the leading factor um, from, you know, a lot of tribes not even going after becoming direct recipients and just going under the state. Um, if you look at it, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelby, but I believe it's 45 tribes under this current national emergency declaration have only, um, you know, have gone direct recipient route, gone the direct recipient route because it's, you know, it's a lot to pick up that cost share, but now hopefully, you know, other tribes will be able to take advantage of it with this new cost share amendment. Thanks. And I would, I would also echo, you know, uh, Nelson's points there. Um, and, and I know David, David preaches this a lot. Um, Executive order 13175, uh, gives the tribes a lot of strength and a lot of flexibility, and and they can request a hundred percent cost share waiver uh, on on everything. Um, and yes, it's a risk, but uh, by all means, uh, you have every right to do so, and I would recommend that you do. And well, let me just uh, underscore that by saying, you know, sometimes there's denials on those requests. Um, but take it from these uh, these guys that uh, you know you, you you appeal that denial and don't stop there. If that denial is denied, take it another step further. So uh, please, uh, you know, don't don't give up on, on the first denial if that happens. So um, uh, the next question has to do with the National Environment and Policy Act. Uh, federal actions require completion of environmental documents. NEPA documents to to date I have found a useful avenue for a tribe to undertake NEPA in advance of a disaster mitigation project, namely HUD allows for prospective applicants to the uh, ICDBG Indian Country Development Block Grant or the Community Development Block Grant program to undertake NEPA as a responsible entity. As such, a tribe has standing through HUD's NEPA process 
part 50 and 58 to begin discussions with other federal agencies in advance of a disaster mitigation project. I have read that FEMA recognizes other federal NEPA processes. Have your panelists seen FEMA recognized tribal generated NEPA documents, whether through the HUD process or some other process? This would save considerable time in responding to a disaster. Floor is open. So Robert, this is Ramon and I have to say I have not seen it, but I am more than willing to take a question if we don't get the answer we need now on to our mitigation folks who work with NEPA and the projects because that is not something I've seen and I do understand the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I have not seen it either, Robert. Um, I can look into it. Yeah. All right. We'll move on to the next question. FEMA benefit cost analysis. I have tried to use the FEMA benefit cost analysis tool and struggle with it. What recommendations do your panelists have with generating an acceptable BCA for FEMA? Um, I can give a, a little insight into that. So <clears throat> as we were working on our brick grant um, not too long ago, we, you know, this, this came up as far as using that, utilizing that tool, I had to go ahead and get some outside assistance uh, from a, a con contractor that we, we typically use for um, any type of like uh, plans that we, you know, that we need assistance with things like that. Um, so there is a way that you can, you can access the, um, the tool so that it's um, so that it's manageable. I think the issue this person is probably experiencing with uh, with that is you you cannot um, you cannot uh, open it up and you know and download anything into it or or even you know even download it. That's the the issues that I was having with it. But um, if you'd like, Robert um, and Kelby, I can uh, send you the workable link that I was that I was given that may help them go through that if that's the issue they're dealing with. Sounds like a plan. Right. That'd be great, Nelson. We'll uh, do a follow-up email to everybody that registered for this uh, for this webinar and the first two webinars. We'll do a follow-up email with all the links and resources. So if any of the presenters have uh, resources that they would like to share, um, feel free to send them to me and we'll send them all a follow-up email. Appreciate it, Nelson. No problem. And Robert, I... I would like to just point out if it continues to be a problem at that link, definitely reach back out to your tribal liaison and let's see if we can connect you to a subject matter expert. Sometimes you just have to get that right resource, that person who does this all the time. But hopefully that link would work that we're going to share. Thank you. Got it. The next question has to do with FEMA grant paperwork and documentation. I have heard stories of exhaustive efforts by tribes and small communities in responding to FEMA's grant and financial reporting. Have your panelists experienced this and what recommendations do they have for a tribe that has yet to go through this process that has a current FEMA grant under current consideration? Can you repeat that last, the last part of the question? Have, have your panelists experienced, the, uh, I have heard stories of exhausted efforts by tribes and small communities in responding to FEMA's grant and financial reporting. Have your, any of your panelists experienced this and what recommendations do they have for a tribe that has yet to go through this process? Hmm. Well, I, we have, you know, we have several grants and under my department alone, we have over 10, 10 grants. Most are, um, are federal. Um, the, the FEMA grants are all, you know, they vary as far as the reporting structure goes. There's different, um, there are different portals that you have to use um, to submit, submit through, like uh, there is a biannual uh, report that you have to do, you know, for the THSGP. Um, and they, <laughs> there's, you know, there's issues sometimes when you're trying to report, when you're trying to do your reporting, but it, um, we've been able to, to manage. Um, I usually you know for each grant you know you have a project officer and then there's a help desk that you know that i reach out to um so i've i've definitely and over the you know six years of, of managing millions of dollars with, with the grants i've applied for have had to reach out to the help desk and, and to our project officers 
Um, but I think it's going to be specific to what grant you're trying to deal with. I, I think we need a little more clarification on the question. Okay. Okay. Again, I want to fall back on at least just a safety net. If it's a specific question for a specific grant that's FEMA, don't hesitate to reach out and let us find you that right resource so that you can get someone that can guide you through either from their health desk, like Tribal Homeland Security grant, or BRIC if it's the building resilient infrastructure and communities. And let's find a person who understands that in that deep detail. Okay. All right, it did seem like a general applicability uh, question. All right. The last question is, uh, has to do with jointly funded projects with FEMA funding and other agencies. ACIAC has funding from a number of sources and the tribe is requesting FEMA funding. The tribe is fortunate to have BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resilience pre-construction funding and is using these funds for developing our managed retreat tasks. We have a pending advanced assistance grant under consideration. In the tribe's narrative, we disclosed the Bureau of Indian Affairs funding for pre-construction activities. FEMA was adamant and reviewed comments that the tribe must avoid duplicative funding, which makes sense. But the tone of the comments struck me as something to take serious note of in the tribe's contract work. For example, we still have one surveyor doing work for both the Bureau of Indian Affairs and FEMA scope of work. I am thinking that I have to issue two separate task orders to the surveyor, one for FEMA and one for BIA, and require the surveyor to record time and materials exactly to each scope of work, even if the surveyor is carrying out survey tasks in the same day for the two separate tasks. Am I overthinking this or should the tribe be extra cautious with the FEMA funding and make sure there is a bright line between similar type of work that is going on in the village at the same time. Robert, I have a fairly short answer. It needs to really be clear and distinct because when grants are then reviewed, if they do see that fuzzy line, they're going to want to know what was BAI project, sorry, and FEMA project. If they want to take that up to with the FEMA grants people for more clarification, I'm happy to do that. But what I have educated the tribes I'm working with is really that documentation, especially going up front, do it now, keep it clean, and your contractor has that capability. That's what you hired them for. So I think it would be real important just for sleeping at night in the long term for that tribe. It's Barrett again. This short video just lays out some policy recommendations that I came up with based on my dissertation and work with Alaska Native Villages. Lots of people have suggested expanding the definition of disaster in the Stafford Act, so it includes erosion, permafrost melt, and even climate change. And I realize that this could face a lot of opposition because FEMA could be overwhelmed with requests for declarations. So the expansion may need to be tailored to something like continuing erosion and or thermal degradation as determined by scientifically verifiable measurements that will functionally destroy the village. And by that, maybe to clarify, it would be result in the loss of critical infrastructure or a critical number of houses being lost within 10 years. And these measurements could be based on certain established protocols. They could be carried out by an entity like the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Services or the, the Army Corps or even communities themselves. Another suggestion is to simply waive the cost sharing requirement for tribes in recognition of the fact that most tribes and basically all Alaska Native villages have no revenue basis and are only able to run operations through federal grants. It's helpful that communities considered small and impoverished have reduced cost shares down to 10%. But even if there's only $2 million worth of damage, most Alaska Native villages are not going to be able to afford a $200,000 bill. The money spent in the aftermath of disasters is disproportionate to the amount spent on disaster preparation. The Stafford Act makes preventative funding under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program equal to a small percentage of money spent on recent disaster declarations, rather than basing spending on the risk of future disasters. 
This means that a community that did not get a presidential disaster declaration in that state cannot get hazard mitigation funding, although it could still potentially apply for BRIC. But even the money for BRIC is based on a percentage of disasters from previous years. And to be eligible, you have to be in a state that had a disaster declaration in the last seven years. So there should be an amount of money set aside for states and tribes, maybe based on their population, or if it is going to be tied to on the ground conditions, then future conditions need to be considered instead of just the past conditions. I'm really stealing Robert's idea here, uh, but I agree that particularly for tribes, I think some sort of baseline funding is needed to build capacity for disaster preparation. And in Alaska, I would love to see the Alaska Native corporations partnering on this effort. Congress could amend the Magnuson-Stevens Act and or the Interjurisdictional Fisheries Act to add subsistence to the section providing for disaster relief. This would allow the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to declare and provide relief for subsistence failures. Finally, Congress could broaden the mandate of the National Department of Housing and Urban Development so that it could better assist communities seeking to protect themselves or relocate in the face of climate change related disasters. Congress could amend the laws governing the community block development grants administered by HUD to specifically provide for elevation and relocation. Please feel free to contact me and keep the conversation going. Thanks so much. Um, so I wanted to provide a quick update in regards to the 25% cost share as it relates to COVID-19. Um, as Ramona mentioned earlier, the standard for FEMA usually is um, the 25% the non-federal cost share through the de disaster declaration process. I will let um, all of you tribal leaders know that that 25% cost share is a ceiling. It is not the floor. So the Stafford Act allows FEMA to set a non-federal cost share up to 25%. Um, as it was briefly mentioned earlier, FEMA does have some flexibility in waiving that to a 10%, 90% cost share. Um, however, the president can completely waive the cost share uh, to zero, which is what uh, President Biden did on January 21st, uh, 2021. Um, in the PowerPoint slides that we'll be sending out, there are links to all of these documents just so you can have them on hand for your nation. So all of the cost share waiver has been waived for the uh, presidential emergency declaration that was declared on March 13th last year. So that is the declaration that the majority of tribal nations that are going direct uh, for COVID-19 funding through FEMA fall under. Um, so it is not just that that cost share is waived uh, going forward. It is also retroactively uh, waived as well. So President Biden actually made the retroactive waiver through a follow-up fact sheet on February 2nd, 2020. And so making sure that your nation is um, taking notes, making sure that you have all of your cost reported will be very important if you decide to become a uh, direct recipient or a subrecipient uh, under the uh, presidential emergency declaration or uh, become a, a, a um, fall under a tribal major disaster declaration. But I really wanted to make sure to highlight that the waiver uh, for the cost share for COVID-19 has been done. You don't have to worry about that issue. And if we head to the next slide, Naomi, um, to, to Nelson's point that he made a little bit earlier, that cost share waiver was something that NCAI really very much advocated on waiving for all tribal nations. And we partnered with several tribal organizations um, and, and other tribal nations on that effort. And so that's a, a big roadblock that has been moved out of the way. However, even though the roadblock has removed in January and early February, it still seems like a lot of tribal nations are not able to access FEMA's resources. Um, there was a concerted effort by tribal organizations to send a letter to Congress in May of last year, highlighting what were the roadblocks that tribal nations were running into. And a lot of those roadblocks have remained. Um, as you can see in this slide, you uh, will discover that it is horrible that there was only 15% of all of Indian country that has been able to access the billions of dollars um, set aside for COVID-19 resources. So in total, it's 91 tribal nations, 43 have gone direct under the presidential uh, emergency declaration. 46 are indirect, so that means that they have gone under a state. Uh, two tribal nations have their own major disaster declaration, uh, the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Navajo Nation. Um, and, but what this really means is 85% of Indian country, 483 tribal nations are not able to access those billions of dollars. And I can tell you, um, you know, if 85% of states were not able to access the billions of dollars that Congress has 
put out the door for this COVID-19 response and recovery effort, there would be a riot. And there needs to be similar action taken to make sure that every single tribal nation has the resources that they need uh, through FEMA in order to respond to this disaster. And additionally to that, to be able to respond to future disasters. Um, I know that Ramona and, and Brian and Jeff and Nelson and even David have all brought up the fact that there are so many different roadblocks um, preventing tribal nations, whether it be having staff on hand and going through these really complicated plan. I can tell you the public assistance administrative plan is very, very long and it's very arduous to get through. And while FEMA has helped states over the last several years, or I would say, um, uh, I, yeah, I'll, I will say they've helped states with consistent uh, technical assistance to prepare these plans. Um, they haven't done that for tribal nations and that really needs to change. So overall, I, I hope that you see that within this section that there is um, some room blocks being removed to access COVID-19 resources through FEMA, but there has to be additional advocacy um, at the federal level to change these laws. So things like amending the Stafford Act. So usually after a major disaster, there are changes to big pieces of emergency management legislation. So if you have lawyer lobbyists um, or other advocates in DC, like in CAI that I work for, that is that is my bread and butter of my work is to advocate on the Hill, uh, make sure that they know that emergency management is important to you and getting you know an amendment to the Stafford Act that says no tribe will have any cost share, what you know, any non-federal cost share could be be a big difference between your tribal nation, uh, you know, being able to uh, actively respond and prepare for disasters going forward. So with all that being said, I know we have a little bit of time. I'd love to turn it back over to Robert and our fellow presenters to give our final thoughts. Um, as I said earlier, we will start wrapping up this session and we'll bring it to a close and then we will give our presenters five minutes to walk away from their computers and then come back and answer a few additional questions. Uh, our attendees are welcome to stick around for that as well. So Robert, I'll hand the, I'll hand the floor off to you. Thanks so much. Just uh, want to turn it back over. I mean, we're taking turns turning it over to the next person. But, you know, the, the, I, I really, really want to thank our uh, presenters today. I mean, this is, to me, it's like in the old days, you know, they, we used to have these war parties out, they're lean and mean, and and, and, and a few of them go out and, and perform and, and do the things they need to do in protecting uh, tribal communities and their families. And they just did an incredible job all along the way. Um, I don't know if you were able to catch the first two sessions, but nevertheless, they, those were we got some extremely wonderful comments back on 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 their, their thoughts and presentations. So, so really, um, my thanks goes out to them. But let's do a quick round final thoughts uh, with Jeff Nelson, Brian, Ramona, and David. Please, Jeff. Uh, well, th thank you, Robert, and uh, and thank you, Kelby, uh, um, uh, and to the other. Uh, uh, presenters on this this panel um, to to those you know listening in uh, I would just stress that you know this is it is a challenge but it is something that can be done and, and and I think it is a true statement of sovereignty when when we have the capacity to take care of our people um, and uh, uh, really eventually become an asset to those around us um, and uh, you know it's a long road, but I would say uh, you're not alone. And uh, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, I know we will do everything we can uh, to uh, provide whatever uh, we can to help you get uh, get through that next step. So thank you for your time and uh, yakoke. Okay. Nelson, thank you, Jeff. All right, yeah, I'd like to echo uh, Jeff's words. Thank you to NCAI and to everyone who has, uh, you know, taken the time uh, to attend this webinar um, and to all our fellow presenters as well. Um, we don't get uh, opportunities like this often where we can um, address these issues that are, you know, affecting all, all tribes. Um, you know, right now, uh, you know, the, it may appear that, you know, like there's, there's not much help out there, but, um, you know, from, you know, from your liaison that uh, that spoke, you know, for for your Alaska region, you know, and from Brian out there, um, it shows that the support is there, um, and to all the tribes um, and leaders on this on this call as well, um, there there is hope out there, and we you know we can get through these um, these incidents, um, you know, it's the same way as states can. It, you know, it's going to be 
It's going to be a little harder. It's not as easy as, um, as what the states have to deal with or even your, your local and uh, county counterparts are. But, you know, collaborating with, within your county and in your, within your state and having MOUs in place and, and, ha and, and leaning on, on us, on, on the, you know, your tribal partners and other tribes as well that have gone through this is critical to getting through this. Um, there's many resources out there that NCAI provides, that USEP provides um, that, are, that are available. So, um, you know, let's try to focus on, you know, the, the hope and the optimism that, you know, that we, you know, we can support our tribal communities, you know, no matter what uh, disaster or, or incident that, that we may face. Um, you know, we, you know, we may have smaller, um, you know, smaller uh, departments and, and staff members to get, to get us through this, but, uh, you know, we, together we're, you know, we're strong and we can unify and, and, uh, and help each other like we've always done. So, uh, yeah, and if anybody has any questions or need any assistance with uh, any of the plans, you know, that, that we've used, um, you know, to, to get us to the point we're at, then, then feel free to uh, email me and reach out at any time. Uh, so, good to to everyone, and please stay safe. Thank you, Nelson. Brian? Thank you, Robert. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is I never want tribes to feel overwhelmed. Um, I know at the start, kind of getting your feet wet with these things, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, I go back to it's not what you know, but who you know. I think we've got a lot of great contacts on here. Um, you can always reach out to me um, or I'm sure any of the people that talk today. Um, like's been said a few times, the small community emergency response plan, the SERP, is a great place to start. Um, the state and federal funding to assist a tribe with a hazard mitigation plan, I think that's another uh, good step. Um, then getting to the point where you can have your own MOU with the state would be great. Um, and then I tried to count because I'm a number cruncher. Uh, I think I counted at least seven different funding sources mentioned today. Um, so my challenge would be to either Robert or NCAI, is there a one pager or so that, that lists all the different funding sources that can assist a tribe um, through all the different areas of disaster response? Um, that would be, I think, one of the most helpful things um, for tribes out there. And if that could be put together, um, you know, like I said, I, I listed seven here. I'm sure there's many, many more, um, but that tribes generally don't know about. And just having that out there um, could help tribes access that funding. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for uh, letting me be part of this. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Robert. Thank you, Brian. Um, we'll, we'll work on that. And uh... Somehow that will happen, I believe, uh, the, your, your thoughts, your request. Ramona. Yeah, thanks. Funny following Brian, the same things I had. Don't be overwhelmed. I want to suggest that we find young adults who have a passion for helping their tribe and start to get them trained and engaged. I think we can really use that asset of those young that have stayed in the villages and get them engaged. Uh, trainings are free, like I said, or they would be reimbursed. I just did a couple steps. The first step, if it was me, I would do that SCURP. Second step, I would do that training. Third step, I would start on those plans. And Robert, in that vein, if you look at the 583 course, I think there's a whole grant section already lined out that tells you several of like the Tribal Homeland Security grant and all those others that came at EMI has already worked on putting together. And then the fourth thing I, I want to touch on is that relationship building, not only with your city that you need to decide how to best make a disaster, but with your state, because they are your response agency and they are there for you and they will help you. Also, if you're in a borough, many Alaska tribes are not, but reach out to your borough and see what they have to offer. Definitely contact me. I'm asking you, many people don't get up in front of you and say, take advantage of me but I am saying that, take advantage if you have questions. I may not have the answers, but I will definitely get you to the right subject matter expert for your answer. And the most important thing of all is thank you for including me. 
Thank you for listening. And I'm really honored to be on this group of panelists. They know quite a bit, and I'm sure we'll all learn from each other. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Dr. Monroe. So uh, I, I need to echo the thank yous um, of everybody. And I did, I just want to share with the group, I did have an opportunity to listen to some of the discussions that went on of how to choose people to present on this. And uh, being a recovering tribal emergency manager, I'm, I'm, I'm never, or, or it's, it's, it's amazing how much talent is out there, and I and and just just for NCI to get to to this group of folks, you know, they started with a a big big swath of of, of folks. So there's a lot of resources and support um, in Indian country that have experiences in working with us, the federal government, to try and get tribes where they need following a disaster and where federal resources are available to assist. So, um, you know, like everyone said, don't hesitate to reach out to them. Um, I shared my contact information earlier. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from NCAI. Robert, thank you for the invite. Thank you for the guidance as always. Uh, everyone else on the on the call, great to see, great to see old friends and, and connect and listen to your thoughts and uh, and take a lot of notes so thank you i just want to thank everybody so much for joining us here today um, during this third webinar if you haven't had a chance yet i would highly encourage you to go watch the first two webinars in this series um, this webinar was really alaska focused which is fantastic that's how we designed it um, but if you're looking for a bit more general information the first two webinars do a great job of walking through the pilot guidance and the declaration um, and i just want to give a, a personal thank you so much to robert holden for you know, really putting together um, today's all three webinars for really working to get uh, fantastic folks from the field to, to give um, information. I want to thank um, all of our technical staff at NCAI, Naomi, Amy, and also our comm staff, Miranda, for helping out with today's event. Um, with that being said, I will hand it over to Robert for our last remarks, and we will uh, close up shop. Robert? Thanks, Shelby. Um, I've really been fortunate to have worked with and, and uh, have around uh, this webinar some extremely talented and bright people. Um, they're just gold. I mean, I, I can't say enough about them. Uh, you know, I, I can't find all these descriptive terms and uh, as to what they have been doing and continue continue to do for their communities, for the tribe, and for all of Indian country, because without them, we wouldn't have this uh, great sessions that we've had. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I, I just think that um, I, I, from the first, in the first session, someone said, how do we begin to get, get placed into the queue in terms of, uh, setting up a uh, emergency management program. What do we do? What's the next step? My response was, you, you've already taken the first step. It, it, it's to express that interest. It's to ask that question. It's to listen to those folks that I just mentioned who are around you, who are willing to help, willing to share uh, their ideals, their thoughts, and their experiences. And trust me, some of those experiences didn't come easy. Uh, they were under the gun. They were you know, in action. They learned the hard way in some instances in terms of managing the disasters without the disasters managing them. So uh, please uh, look to them, contact them, let them know that uh, uh, you're wanting to uh, follow the paths. You know, nobody is born with. Uh, emergency management skills. Uh, it's all learned. We start somewhere and, um, uh, but you're on your way and uh, anything anyone can help you with, I'm sure they will do that for you. Uh, we generally start and end these sessions with an invocation and a closing prayer. I apologize that we didn't do that. We didn't have someone um, uh, lined up for this, but if, if I could, if you could just bear with me a moment, uh, I'm going to say a few uh, closing thoughts to the creator. So uh, with that, um, gosh, walk off into west, north, east, south, longest mother. Creator, give her life, give all things. Thank you for this day. And thank you for all the wonderful things you have provided for us, all these things around us that watch over us, protect us, provide for us. 
May they always be there. May they always live and grow in a good way. May they continue to watch over the people and help us in all we do. Uh, for those who have gone before us, the elders, uh, men and women here, the children and the unborn generation, those yet to come, that they will always be healthy, strong, protect them from all those things that might befall them, and that they might live long lives upon this Mother Earth. And thank you for these people. Thank you for all those who watch over us and help us on a regular basis. They're on the front lines, whether in the military or overseas, wherever that might be, bring them home safely and bless their homes and families. And these people who have been around us and working with us, the dangers they face on a regular basis, take care of them in a good way. And thank you for their thoughts. And thank you for what they have to share. And the good things they say and do for the people. Bless them with that many good things to their homes and their families. Go with us this day and let it be good from this day forward. Thank you, my friends. And we look forward to, to all you do. And uh, take care.